An alien race from the depths of space colonizes Earth. Millions of people from around the world are sent to work in mines on other planets. Those left on Earth are controlled with implanted tracking chips and giant alien robots positioned around the perimeters of cities. Don't let them use you! You hear me? Ah! Chicago, 2019. The city is under martial law due to a massive alien attack on all major cities of the world. The Drummond family, a father, a mother, and their two sons, tries to leave the city, but all exits are blocked. When a police officer stops their car at one of the exits, the father presses the gas pedal and breaks through the blockade. Entering an exit tunnel, the man is forced to stop as the exit is blocked by aliens. Taken by surprise, the father freezes, although his wife asks him to turn around. Suddenly, an unknown pulse tears through both adults sitting in the front seats. The children, looking up, see an incomprehensible creature standing right in front of their car's hood. Nine years later, the world, having surrendered without a fight to the invaders, is completely under their control. The operation of vital productions, including power plants, has been restored everywhere. The aliens are called legislators because all laws and rules now come from them. Over the years since Earth's surrender, the aliens have forced humans to build suitable living spaces for them underground, called closed zones, where only high-ranking human officials are allowed entry. It became clear that the alien invasion aimed at Earth's resources, their extraction, and exportation led to huge social stratification. The rich, working for the aliens, continue to live well while the poor have lost all guarantees, including education and healthcare. Police lawlessness thrives, and the deportation of all undesirable people from the planet has begun. The alien systems block all communication lines, so people know nothing about the life of other cities and countries. Amidst this wave, a resistance emerged, planning an attack on the closed zone in Chicago. But the plan failed, the zone was unharmed, and the fate of the rebels remains unknown, although the police assure that they were all eliminated. And this was supposed to be the first spark from which a flame would ignite. Nine years after the failed uprising in Chicago, the police monitor anyone who raises even the slightest suspicion. Detective William Mulligan reviews video recordings from Gabriel's apartment, whose brother Rafe died in the uprising and was posthumously named a hero of the resistance. The guy goes through his usual morning routines, then wakes up his girlfriend, showing her a photo taken on the other side of the lake where visiting is now prohibited. But the girl does not want to believe in a change in their lives and asks not to invent the impossible. Gabe leaves the house where his friend, who has obtained and repaired a boat, is already waiting for him so they can sail out of the city tonight. But Gabe reminds him that he is under round-the-clock surveillance. Meanwhile, Mulligan reviews the newspapers and sees an advertisement for the Phoenix fire suppression system, after which he goes to his old friend Jane, who now runs a brothel. At the entrance, he sees the Phoenix emblem on the wall and notices the police chief. The owner greets Mulligan as a good friend and hands him a gift box, mentioning the Donnans and their gifts. Returning to the police station, he shares his findings. Phoenix exists and is preparing something for the New World Masters, but his partner does not believe that anyone could have survived the last purge. At this time in the subway, two resistance members meet because the newspaper advertisement is a battle readiness order given by their leader, whom they call First. He has learned that there is an entrance to the zone through the stadium, and soon there will be a unity festival, which high-ranking aliens will attend. The only thing left is to infiltrate. The next day, Gabe goes to work, having passed through the recognition system, since every person now has an identifier chip inside. The guy works in a data restoration center where he views millions of private videos a day and checks browser history requests. He sends all the collected information to the Central Information Center and destroys the carriers. Later, he receives a cigarette containing an unknown substance from his colleague and hides it behind his ear. After work, Gabe exits to the outside with a crowd of other workers and sees arriving guards grab and lead away one of the women. At the same time, an alien transport ship is sending off another batch of people as slaves for the alien mines from Earth and around the perimeter of the city stand giant alien robots to prevent people from escaping. Gabe goes to the boat, but is horrified at the sight of the weapon in his friend's hands. If they get caught, they will be instantly destroyed. Their scuffle is interrupted by the appearance of Mulligan, who orders Gabe to get into his car. He reminds the boy that he was his father's partner and now asks not to repeat his brother's mistakes and make the right choice. 
Gabriel has no information about Phoenix and he does not intend to snitch, so the conversation goes nowhere. Gabriel goes to the person he is supposed to sell the acquired cigarette to, but the potential client pushes the boy into his van and putting on them special collars that jam the tracking chip signal, drives him to the center of a destroyed district, where in one of the surviving buildings, Gabe meets his living brother. After a joyful reunion, Rafe tells him that he is the only survivor from his group. Unknown to him, Craftsman removed his chip, and now he has joined a new group. He takes the cigarette and giving his brother a large sum of money, orders him to leave the area because Phoenix plans to attack the invaders. The brothers argue about the necessity of the uprising, but Rafe is sure that as long as there is time to fight, they should fight. Gabriel then rushes into his apartment and hurriedly starts packing, convincing his girlfriend to join him. The girl tries to persuade the boy to stay, and seeing the money and learning that Rafe is alive, asks the boy to think carefully, as they could then be recorded as accomplices. The couple argues, unaware that the police are closely listening to their conversation. Gabe leaves alone, but immediately encounters Mulligan, who was following him. Gabriel runs away from Mulligan and hides in the secret passages underground. He puts on the remaining collar, and the alien's drones do not lose sight of him. Mulligan returns to the station, where he has an entire room dedicated to Phoenix, and notes that Rafe might be alive. At this time, Rafe's carrier pigeon reaches the recipient, and the information is passed along the chain to a secret IP center, where upon entering the received numbers, its worker displays Phoenix's target, an official who will gain access to the closed zone that day. The newspapers immediately publish Phoenix's announcement, and the group members receive the call. One of them, working on the radio, plays a conditional track heard by a man with a dog who immediately takes her for a walk. Her bark is heard by a mechanic girl who rushes to her car. Later, they arrive at an underground clinic where a doctor performs complex operations to remove the tracking chips. Then, he hands over the chips extracted from law-abiding citizens previously deceased from diseases, as well as special containers that need to be kept in the mouth, so they too will be recognized as law-abiding citizens. Meanwhile, one of the resistance members, serving as a priest, meets with Rafe. The pair goes to an arms dealer and receives invisible explosive material from a girl extracted from a crashed alien ship. If attached to an organic carrier skin or hair, scanners will not be able to detect it. Later, the resistance group gathers together. The leader distributes containers with new chips and shows a photo of the person who will go to the aliens. Lastly, he hands out poison capsules to everyone, which will help avoid being captured alive by the enemy. The group freely enters the festival and attaches the invisible alien explosive device to an official. He goes to the arriving aliens and explodes with them. The city is immediately locked down and the police block the streets to find the attackers. The priest is the first to die, caught in gunfire. Rafe is caught by one of the aliens and tries to escape from it, hiding in a van. This is seen by the guy's comrades, who come to his rescue and destroy the alien. The surviving rebels try to escape from the city, while the aliens bring in hunter warriors from another world, and they quickly track down Rafe and his accomplices. Enraged, the legislators prepare to destroy the district, where, according to their information, the resistance is based. Mulligan tries to persuade the police chief, who is heading to report to the aliens, not to allow this because he needs time to catch the suspects. But he is reminded that the decision is made and his search interests no one. Raids begin in the city, during one of which Gabe is captured, while his brother and two of his comrades reach the station and board buses two minutes before the expiration of the chips from law-abiding citizens. But when it seems they have managed to escape, the buses are stopped by the hunters. Realizing his capture is inevitable, one of the group takes the poison capsule. The mechanic girl attacks a hunter and is instantly vaporized. Rafe tries to run but is captured and brought to the police, where his brother is being interrogated at the same time. Mulligan shows him how Rafe is tortured to make him talk about Phoenix and give up first. Gabe learns that the city is preparing for destruction and agrees to send a message to the leader. He is brought to the surviving members of the resistance, and hearing that the guy allegedly knows ways into the zone, they agree to connect him with first. Gabe is brought to Jane Doe, who is number one and the leader of the resistance in the city. Upon seeing the boy, the woman calls him by name, which confuses Gabrielle, and at that moment, a police squad raids the brothel and kills Jane. 
The investigation reveals that Jane had installed listening devices to record conversations with police officers she served to gather secret information. Later, during a briefing with the aliens, Mulligan names the members of Phoenix who, learning about the death of First, voluntarily left this life. Before the invasion, Jane was a history teacher and changed her profession to gather secret information. Mulligan presents recordings obtained in the brothel, where it is heard that the police chief actively leaked secret information about the aliens. Captured resistance members are deported to alien mines, and Mulligan, having declared the neutralization of the Chicago threat, is appointed acting commissioner. Later, he meets with Gabe and puzzles the boy with a new thought. What if the failure of the uprising was planned? And he hands the boy a memory card extracted from a phone once given to him by Jane. The next day, Gabe views its contents, a video dedicated to a party before his birth, where close family friends record messages for him. There, he sees both Mulligan and Jane Doe, who was acquainted with his mother, as well as some other members of Phoenix. Meanwhile, Mulligan is allowed to arrive at the Earth Control Center and meet with the legislators in their habitat. As he heads to the spaceship, the same invisible substance that was part of the explosive used in the stadium attack manifests on him, explaining that Mulligan is also part of the resistance, and the plan was organized so that he could infiltrate the main alien base and set off an explosion. During the credits, a map shows that the plan worked and the city blockades were successfully lifted, after which many resistance foci flared up everywhere. This means that the plan to light a match and ignite a bonfire was a success and humanity begins an active fight against the alien oppressors. Despite the film being labeled as science fiction, the message here is quite realistic. How will humanity behave when it realizes the possibility of its total occupation? Also, the filmmakers draw belief in victory from the history of humanity using Lenin's motto, a spark will kindle a flame. The struggle, the underground conspiracy, the film is full of revolutionary stylistics and it watches like a real political thriller.